Good morning to everybody. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about, what Jesus taught about Israel in the end time. So let's turn in our Bibles to two passages today. We're going to go to Matthew 24, and we're going to eventually end up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at your word, we know that it speaks with clarity and accuracy. This is not iffy. <laughs> this is not maybe. This is absolute. You look at the future with complete understanding and you reveal it to us now. Help us to be ready for what is ahead. Help us to be ready for your return. And I pray for any person here or listening or watching who does not yet know you, help them to be ready before this day is over. We commit this time of Bible study to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we've been looking together in this little series in a series. We're looking at the life of Christ from all four Gospels, but we've taken a little time to slow down here in Matthew 24 as we look at the words of Jesus about the end Times And as I've said before, the Bible is the one book that dares to predict the future. Okay, now, other books have predicted the future, but none with 100% accuracy. That's the difference. And surely, God wants his people to know about Bible prophecy because he has dedicated 30% of his scripture to it. For example, the Old Testament features more than 100 prophecies of the coming of Christ. And through these prophecies, we know Jesus was the Messiah because he fulfilled every one. This is how believers can be so confident now that Christ will come again to this earth and set up his kingdom because he promised he would. Because five times more frequently, then he promised he would come the first time. He promises to come again the second time. Jesus said, I will come again. But why study Bible prophecy? Some people say, well, it's all so confusing and I can't sort it out. Well, then study it a little more. <laughs> because there's a blessing promised to the person who reads and hears and keeps the book of Revelation and certainly that would be uh, applicable in principle to all teachings on end times events because I think the more we know about the next world, the better we will live in this one. And by the way, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us, but to prepare us. Let me say that again. Bible prophecy or the study of it is not there to scare us, it's there to prepare us. These are signs of the times that Christ told us we should be looking for. Now, we've dealt with a number of them, but I've saved what I believe is the most important for last. And we're talking now about the miracle of Israel, the regathering together of the Jewish people back in their homeland again. The Bible said this would happen as a sign of the end. In fact, over in Ezekiel 37, God was very specific. He said he would take Israel uh, from among the nations where they've gone. Then he said he would gather them from every side in their own land. Then he said he would make one nation in the land. Those are very pointed prophecies. God promises that the Jewish people would be scattered and regathered. That's happened. God promised they would return to the land of Israel. That's happened. But even more, God promised that they would become a nation again. That too has happened. God promised that Jerusalem would be their capital. That too has happened. So there's a lot that has already happened, but there are still some things yet in the future that Jesus deals with here in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. Number one, after Israel regathers as a nation, a new world leader will emerge identified as the Antichrist or the beast. And he's going to make a covenant with the Jewish people and rebuild their temple. This will be the third temple. Secondly, there's going to be a large force uh, from the north of Israel identified as Gog that will attack her. We'll talk about that more in a moment. <clears throat> also, the Battle of Armageddon is going to happen there in the Middle East in the Valley of Megiddo, which is part of Israel. Finally, Christ will come back and set foot on the Mount of Olives. So here's 
the mind-blowing thing, to use 60s vernacular for a moment. These words given by Christ on the Mount of Olives are speaking about when he'll come again to this same location because his foot will set down on this mountain. So now we come back to the question of his disciples. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus tells them to look to Israel, or as he put it, to learn the parable of the fig tree. Let's read about it. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree, says our Lord. When its branches already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know summer is near. So you also, when you see all of these things, know it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. We'll stop there. Now Israel is compared on more than one occasion in the Bible to a fig tree. In Hosea 9.10, God says, I have found Israel as the first fruits of a fig tree. Joel and Jeremiah also refer to Israel as a fig tree. So Jesus is telling us that the rebirth of Israel is a sign of the end. But listen, not just a sign, it's the super sign. You know, when you go to the uh, McDonald's or a place like that, you might ask them to supersize it. Well, this is the super sign that God has given, the regathering of the Jews. Over in Ezekiel 37, I referred to it, but God said in verse 11 uh, to Ezekiel that he was to go to a graveyard. And as Ezekiel stood there, bodies burst out of the grave, bones came together, muscle was attached to the bone, flesh was attached to the muscle. And then God told him what it all meant. He said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say, thus says the Lord, behold, O my people, I'll open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. Could God have been any more specific? Who would have thought such a thing possible during World War II? If you were a Jew living in the Warsaw ghetto, fearing uh, the Nazis coming to arrest you, could you believe such a thing could happen? If you were one of those Jews in one of those concentration camps set up by the Nazis like Auschwitz or Treblinka or Ravensbrück, would you have ever thought that there would be a homeland for the Jewish people again? If Hitler had continued in the pattern he was following, we would have seen a great many of the Jewish people wiped out, but thankfully, that war came to an end, and thankfully the United States of America stepped in. But now we look at, uh, that's worth clapping for, we're Americans. Eh? <laughs> but to return to the homeland, this seems unthinkable. It seems impossible. But God said this would happen. And on May 14th, 1948, a modern day miracle took place. The establishment of the nation of Israel. David Ben-Gurion, who is sort of like the George Washington of modern Israel, made this statement on that day. Ezekiel 37 has been fulfilled, and the nation Israel is hearing the footsteps of the Messiah, end quote. Fascinating statement from a prime minister recognizing that prophecy was fulfilled. On Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 27th of 2010, in Auschwitz, Poland, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, made this amazing statement, and I quote, we have returned to our homeland from every corner of the earth. The Jewish people rose from ashes. Dry bones became covered with flesh. A spirit filled them, and they lived and stood at their own feet. As Ezekiel prophesied, then uh, Netanyahu went on to quote from Ezekiel 37. So here is this modern miracle. Yet it's such a tiny little piece of land. I mean, you think of all the nations in the world and all the cities in the world. Why do we hear so much about tiny little Israel? Did you know that Israel at its widest point is nine miles wide? The entire country is about the size of New Jersey. The nation Israel is 154th among the nations uh, of the world. You could fit 32 states of Israel in the state of Texas. That shows you how little it is. Yet you can hardly pick up a newspaper or go to a news website or turn on the television without some 
mention of the conflict today in the Middle East and specifically Israel and even more specifically Jerusalem. Why is this? The answer is quite simple. Israel is at the eye of the hurricane of the great events of the end times. She occupies center stage in God's drama of the ages. She and other players are behind the prophetic curtain and they're hitting their marks. You know, like when you go to see a play and, and all the performers are behind the curtain and they all hit their mark, they get ready. And as the curtain opens, the play begins. And this is what's happening. All the players are hitting their marks. No, the curtain is not open yet, but it will soon. And this was all predicted long ago by the Hebrew prophets and those who have sought to eradicate or destroy the Jewish people or their nation have paid a heavy price because God made a promise to Abraham years ago and to his descendants. And the Lord said, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. Look at the nations that have tried to destroy Israel. They lie on the ash heap of history today. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Rome, and more modern times, Spain and Germany, and perhaps very soon, Russia. One of the reasons that God has blessed the United States of America is because we have stood by the Jewish people and we have stood by the state of Israel. Now let me make a provocative statement. It's true. <clears throat> let me make a provocative statement. America needs Israel more than Israel needs America. Now, we've been a great ally for them and we've given them a lot of money and we've done a lot for them and God has blessed us. One of the reasons God has blessed our country is because we've blessed them, but we need them because we need the blessing of God and that's why I, I have great concern over the new tension that we have with the nation of Israel today. I hope that changes. But Israel has fought ever since her declaration as a state. Here's 65 later, she's uh, 65 years later, even longer now, she's closing in on, our seven, on her 70th anniversary. She's still under attack. Pretty much on every border, she is under attack by Islamic extremists. You have suicide bombers, homicide bombers, rocket and missile attacks, genocidal threats from Middle Eastern neighbors, and political pressure from Europe, and now even to some degree the United States. You remember that ceasefire that Israel had with the Palestinians following 50 days of conflict. More than 4,500 rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israel. We told Israel, stand down. Let me ask this question. What would we do if 4,500 rockets were fired at us from, say, Canada? Because that's about how close things are. You think America would just stand by and say, that's cool, no, whatever. No, I think we would strike back. And as the Israelis defended themselves, they uncovered a series of intricate tunnels that had been built underground. And this is where the suicide bombers had been going through to get into the nation. So you have all that going out on, but now we have the emergence of this new terrorist army. We've never seen anyone like them before who identify themselves as ISIS. They're gaining ground in Iraq. They're closing in now on Baghdad. They're solidifying ownership of half of Syria last Tuesday, <clears throat> ISIS captured a strategically located power plant in Libya and is closing in on the country's oil fields. And listen to this, Australian intelligence just gave a warning that ISIS has enough material to build a weapon of mass destruction. According to this warning, they say that ISIS has gained enough radioactive material to build a large dirty bomb. Add to this the fact that this is the richest terrorist group in existence today, taking in millions of millions of dollars. They capture territory, they seize assets, they capture people and sell them as slaves, they kidnap people and take in ransoms and sometimes kill them anyway. And then they butcher people. And they have <clears throat> set their sights on Christians in particular, beheading them, even crucifying them. They kidnapped 88 Christians from Libya last week alone. Last month, the jihadists captured Ethiopian Christians and executed them. In February, they beheaded 21 Christians. And these enemies 
of Israel and really enemies of America have one thing in common. They are radical Islamists. And the objective of a radical Islamist is to establish what they call a caliphate. They do this through jihad, which is their struggle. They want a world that is ruled by Sharia law, a system of government that many Muslim-controlled countries have today. Sharia law is basically <clears throat> the rule by the Quran, which is the Bible of Islam. They go about accomplishing this in one of two ways. It's either conquest or infiltration. Either they take territories over, as ISIS has done, or they infiltrate. <clears throat> in um, England today, there are actual portions of the country that are under Sharia law because so many Muslims have moved there. Add to this the fact, <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink of water for a second if you don't mind. <clears throat> That's really a weird, awkward moment, wasn't it? <laughs> Out of this, the fact that many of these Islamic extremists are at war with themselves. You have two main branches of Islam today, Sunni and Shia. The Sunnis uh, comprise about 90% of Muslims and the Shia make up the remaining population. ISIS, for instance, is Sunni and Iran is a majority of Shia Muslims. So, Though they hate each other, there's only one group they hate even more, and that is the nation Israel, and they all want Jerusalem. Now this is fascinating to me, because Jerusalem is right there at the eye of the storm. And this is exactly what God said would happen in the last days. Not Washington, D.C., not Moscow, not Beijing, not Norco, or Irvine, <laughs> Jerusalem. This is what God said would happen, Zechariah 12, three. God says, I'll make Jerusalem and Judah like an intoxicating drink to all the nearby nations that send their armies to besiege Jerusalem. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone and a burden for the world. Jesus said in Luke 21, 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that the time of its destruction has arrived. And one of Iran's leaders came out and said recently, quote, we must spare no effort in liberating holy Jerusalem and cutting off the hands of the infidels from this holy site, end quote. So here we see nation, the nation of Israel regathered. We see Jerusalem as their capital. Now, after Ezekiel 37 is Ezekiel 38. Is that not a profound insight? Come on. <laughs> but that's important because Ezekiel 37 says the Jews will be scattered, the Jews will be regathered, the Jews will have a homeland again. That has all happened. What happens in Ezekiel 38? We read about a large force from the north of Israel attacking her. This force is identified as Gog. They come from the land of Magog. Now get out any map and look to the north of Israel and you'll find the nation of Russia. Now is Russia Gog? They very well could be. But here's where it gets even more interesting. One of the allies that marches with Gog against Israel is identified as Persia. <laughs> Who is Persia? Well, it's modern Iran. There are Iranians today that still identify themselves as Persians. In fact, Iran only took on that name uh, back in 1935. Up to that point, they were known as Persia. Now, this is fascinating because if Russia is Gog, there has been no alliance to speak of between the Russians and the Iranians until fairly recently, and they've pulled closer together, and we... I read recently that uh, the Russians are building two nuclear facilities in Iran with an additional six more to come. This is why Prime Minister Netanyahu said to win the war with ISIS and to not disarm Iran is to win the battle and lose the war. Now listen, Iran makes no secret of their des desire to destroy Israel. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, recently tweeted, yes, he tweets. <laughs> he recently tweeted this statement, quote, Israel must be annihilated. Is that clear enough? 
Uh, one of Iran's leaders said, quote, the destruction of Israel is the idea of the Islamic revolution in Iran, and it's one of the pillars of the Iranian Islamic regime. We cannot claim we have no intention of going to war with Israel. I came across an interesting video that will roll right now. This is an animation that was produced by Iran, and it was shown on Iranian television, and this is a simulation, an animation, of what an attack against Israel would look like. Coming from Iran, we have these rockets raining down on Tel Aviv. They're very specific, you can see, with their targets. Uh, we have the military base here, uh, and also a missile launch site. The International Bank of Israel there in Tel Aviv. They also have the Tel Aviv airport, another nuclear site. This is their vision. This is their objective. This is what they want to do. In fact, the general of their army said they can by themselves destroy Israel. I say, let them try. They're going to be in for a big surprise. Things are not going to go the way they hope they would go. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says Iran will have hostility toward Israel. The Bible says Iran will be one of the allies to march with Gog against Israel. But God is going to intervene and turn back this army and do a great miracle. And after this miracle of turning back this army, uh, the Bible says they're going to burn the weapons from that conflict for seven years. It makes me think this could happen before the tribulation begins. Nobody knows with absolute certainty, but here's what we do know. A large force from the north identified as Gog will attack Israel, but then God intervenes, destroys much of the invading force, and a great spiritual awakening breaks out in the nation of Israel among the Jewish people they start turning to Jesus as their Messiah. Now here's where it affects you and it affects me. Because right now, we are living in a time where God is working primarily outside of the nation of Israel. You say, I don't know about most of you, but chances are you're not Jewish by birth. You're what they call a Gentile, as am I. And we as Gentiles have been grafted into the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God gave us the scriptures through the Jewish people. God gave us our Messiah through the Jewish people. But right now, by and large, most Jews do not believe in Yeshua as Hamashiach, Jesus as the Messiah. But after this divine intervention, many of them will turn to God. Now listen to this. I don't think this revival can break out until the full gathering of the Gentiles takes place. You say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Listen to this verse, Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Paul says, I want you to understand this mystery, dear friends, so you will not feel proud and start bragging. Some of the Jews have hard hearts, but this will last only until the complete number of Gentiles come to Christ. The complete number of Gentiles come to Christ. To me, this is saying that God is waiting for those last people to believe, even that last person to believe, and then we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air before this revival breaks out. Can you imagine if you found out that today in our uh, sanctuary, there is in attendance the last person God is waiting for to believe so the church can be raptured? Would you be tempted to apply a little pressure on that person? Who are they? Where are they? We don't know. But that person will believe and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. As you can see, these things I have shared are very current. They're very relevant. And they're happening before our eyes. So what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live as a follower of Jesus? How should this impact me in day-to-day -day living? As I said earlier, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us, but to prepare us. How should I be prepared? That brings us to our second passage. Turn over there with me, if you would. 1 Thessalonians 5. I'll read just a couple of verses. Actually, a few. 1 Thessalonians 5. Therefore, writes Paul, 
Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But those who are of the day should be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. All right, so the teaching of Christ's imminent return is a real litmus test of where you are at spiritually. I think if you're walking with God and your life is right with him, when you hear Christ could come back at any moment, it excites you, it motivates you, it thrills you. But I think if you're not right with God, hearing that Christ could come back at any moment frightens and alarms you. So if you're living as you ought to live, you welcome this and you can say with the Apostle John, even so, come. We sing it together. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That's the heart cry of the man or the woman that is walking with God. So there's three things we are to do according to the verses that we just read in Thessalonians. We need to wake up, we need to sober up, and we need to suit up. Wake up, sober up, suit up. Let's deal with the first one. We need to wake up. Verse six, let us not sleep as others do. I read a pretty good definition of sleep in the Encyclopedia Britannica. By the way, that's a book. <laughs> it preceded Google. And so I looked up the definition of sleep, and here's what they say, quote, sleep is a state of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a decrease in responsiveness to events taking place, end quote. That's a pretty good definition of sleep, isn't it? And that's a pretty good definition of some Christians in the church today. A state of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a decrease in responsiveness to events taking place. There are people in the church that have gone asleep. Don't forget that these words are directed not to non-believers, but to Christians. God is saying to you, he's saying to me, wake up, be alert, because some of us aren't. For some, there's a state of lethargy, passiveness, even a laziness. God says, wake up. Some of us are sleepwalking instead of walking in the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but after I have a good meal, I get sleepy, right? And sometimes if I eat something like Mexican food, I go into what I like to describe as a food coma. <laughs> You're out. And one of the easiest ways to get sleepy is to eat a lot. So here's where it gets interesting. You know, we sit here in this church and we hear the Word of God taught over and over again. This is one of the easiest places to go to sleep because you take it in and you take it in and you're not applying it and you find yourself becoming lethargic. You find yourself becoming passive. No, the fact is we should take these words in and they should impact our life and the way that we live and we should be looking forward to the Lord's return. But sometimes we become sermon connoisseurs instead of fishers of men. Paul says, <clears throat> Paul says, be ready for the Lord's return. You remember the anticipation you had when you were a little kid for Christmas Day? If you believed in Santa, you believe he was gonna somehow get his large frame down your little chimney, eat the cookies that you left out for him, and then deposit presents uh, underneath your tree. So you look forward to that. By the way, there's, there's, life has been described this way. There's four phases of life. Phase number one, you believe in Santa Claus. Phase number two, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Phase number three, you become Santa Claus. <laughs> and phase number four, you look like Santa Claus. And <laughs> clearly that's where I am now. Uh, I put on a, a red jogging suit the other day and kids started climbing up on my lap and telling me what they wanted for Christmas. It was humiliating. Anyway, so, but as kids, you know, I can hardly wait till Santa comes. And that's how we should be as we think of Jesus. I can hardly wait till he comes again. You're looking forward to it. It's not a miserable, repressive, repressive confining way to live. It's a happy, joyful purposeful way to live. So you need to wake up, number one. Number two, you need to sober up. Sober up, verse eight. Let those who are of the day be sober. 
Having spent the first 17 years of my life around alcoholic people, I think I have a pretty good working knowledge of what drunk people look like. I watch them all drink every single night. There are different ways that different people react to alcohol. Some people are described sometimes as a happy drunk and laughing. Everything's funny. They think they're funny. They aren't. But then there are people that just get tired. Maybe they fall asleep. Then there are those mean drunks. They get angry. They start screaming. They turn violent. By and large, I had a lot of those mean drunks around me. And so I've seen the effects of alcohol and the problem with the person that's drinking is they don't think they are coming under the influence. They think they're maintaining well, but actually they aren't. And so God is saying, don't be drunk. And this can be taken quite literally. Don't get drunk. Don't be under the influence of the Spirit, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. Don't be drunk with wine, because that's a waste, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's an amazing thought. If you drink, you can get drunk. If you don't drink, you won't get drunk. Simple as that. So I don't drink. Oh, Greg, you're really missing out, am I? I don't think so. I think I've seen the devastating effects of alcohol on far too many lives, and I don't need to go down that road. I don't want to be under the control of anything or anyone but Jesus Christ, and I'm happy with that. I'm not missing anything. <laughs> Having said that, if you don't drink, you won't get drunk. I have to confess to you, I have been pulled over for a DUI. Absolutely true. In fact, it was on New Year's Eve a number of years ago. I'd spoken at church and I was driving home and CHP came up behind me. They lit me up. And this cop, I don't know why he did it. He uses like his loudspeaker. Pull your car to the side of the road. Oh, geez. You know, it's the lights and the loudspeaker. And I pull over and, and he actually says to me, put your hands on the steering wheel and do not move. I'm just like. <laughs> he comes walking up. I rolled down my window. Yes, officer. Have you been drinking, sir? Uh, water? I had a little bottle of water. No, I mean, have you been drinking alcohol? Officer, I've not been drinking alcohol. He says, get out of the car. So I get out of the car. And he actually has me walk the little line. I'm walking the line. He takes out a pencil. He says, follow this with your eyes. I'm looking back and forth. And I'm getting nervous. I've drunk nothing. I'm nervous. What if I fail the test? <laughs> and what if somebody drives by and says, hey, look, it's Pastor Greg. <laughs> Getting pulled over for a DUI. God bless you, Pastor Greg. <laughs> That's good. I like the way you did that. Do that again. God bless you, Pastor Greg. I like that. That's very friendly. That's very friendly. Well done. Let's give her a round of applause. Well, he was finally convinced I had not been drinking. I did tell him I'm a pastor and I just preached a sermon. He let me go. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's other things we can be intoxicated by besides alcohol or drugs. And by the way, let me just say, I am so against the legalization of marijuana on so many levels. <laughs> Such a mistake. Look, I can speak from my own personal experience. I used to smoke marijuana as a kid. I pretty much got stoned every single day for about two years of my life, and I lost my motivation. I was just a typical, hey man, what's up guy? <laughs> and I saw what it did to me and what it did to my friends, and there's no question it's a gateway drug, and there's no question it's gonna have a destructive effect, and the marijuana of today is far more potent than the kind we were smoking back in the 60s and 70s. This is a bad idea, okay? Bad idea. But having said this little, you know, soapbox there. But having said that, we don't want to be under the influence of any of this junk, but there's other things we can be intoxicated by. You ever buy something new and get kind of a rush? You buy it, <laughs> you know? Endorphins are released, woo. That's why they call it retail therapy. 
to go get some retail therapy. You know, you got that thing on sale. <laughs> you know. I think a lot of times it's a thrill of the hunt. Don't you think? You look and you look and you look. You're so excited. Then you get it and you look and you go, yeah, whatever. And you move on to something else. Right? And people can live that way. They can just be obsessed with getting this next thing and they can be distracted. Jesus actually gave us this warning in Luke 21, 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness. Listen, and the cares of this life and that day come upon you unexpectedly. The cares of this life, it's not always the bad things that mess us up. It's the good things that become the most important things. Then they turn into bad things. Because you're more concerned about all the affairs of life and you don't think about the next life. You're all concerned about things you can hold in your hand. You don't think about those eternal things. To be sober does not mean to be miserable. You know, some Christians, they're just downers, okay? And they think it's spiritual. You know, someone tells a joke, I'm not laughing, man. The Bible says be sober. You know, shut up. You're just... Learn how to interpret scripture. It doesn't mean you have to be Debbie Downer. What it means is you need to be clear-headed. That's what the word sober means. Clear-headed. You're thinking clearly. Be sober. Wake up. Sober up. One last one. Suit up. Verse 8. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. Listen, here's the bottom line. The moment you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you entered into a spiritual battle. <laughs> the devil didn't want you to believe in the first place. Now he's going to do everything he can to stop you from moving forward spiritually. Ephesians 6, 12 says, we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule the world, against Wicked spirits in the heavenly realm. So use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy in the time of evil. So after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. So you might say, well, I don't like to fight. Well, then you're going to just get beat down. That's all. Because you're in this battle if you want to be or not. So you have to make a choice. You're either going to win or lose. You're either going to have victory or defeat. You're either going to gain ground or lose ground. You're going to progress or regress. That's up to you. But here's what God says. Suit up. Put on the armor. What do you put on? Paul picks up two pieces in particular. And Paul certainly knew a lot about Roman armor. Because he spent a lot of time chained to Roman soldiers. So, you know, when you're sitting chained to someone for days on end, you start talking. So, hey, tell me how that armor works. There was the breastplate that the soldier would wear in the battle. The breastplate was important because it protected the vital organs. And so put on the breastplate of faith and love, not the breastplate of feeling. See, our life as a follower of Jesus is a life of faith, not emotion. Emotions come and go. And if you allow your fickle feelings to control you, you're going to crash and burn. you got to stand on the Word of God. Put on that breastplate and keep it on every day. And then the helmet of salvation. Now what does a helmet do? It protects your head. And in the same way, we put on this helmet of salvation and it protects our mind. Why? Because you will stop and think. If you stop and think, you'll recognize that Almost every temptation you've ever given in to started as a thought. Am I right? Started as a thought. You know, you're just, maybe you're in church or you're leaving church, all of a sudden there's a little and it's impure thought, thought of doubt, thought of pride, whatever it is, boom, thought. And you say, well, I know that's not true or I know that's wrong, but I might just try it out for fun. I'll just let that thought come in. Okay, now that thought starts taking root in your heart. And now that thought is becoming an issue. It's been said, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. See, it started with a thought, though. That's why you need to protect your mind. You say, well, I don't get what you're saying. Don't let those thoughts in in the first place. As it has been said, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop him from making a nest in your hair. In my case, he better bring his own materials. Because <laughs> there ain't no 
hair up here. I can't stop the thought from coming my way or even knocking on the door of my imagination. But I don't, I don't have to open the door and invite it in. And that's why the Bible says I should bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. You know, on my computer, because I save all kinds of pictures, I take endless photos of my grandchildren. What can I say? I just have so many, and I don't ever throw a photo away. Even if it's blurry, if it's of someone I care about, I keep it. So I have all these photos. I have way too many photos. Am I? And you know, every now and then I'm working on something, like maybe a sermon, uh, and it's in a document, and I go, save, and a little thing comes up, memory full. Oh no. What do I do? I have to empty the trash, first of all, on my computer. That helps. But maybe I have to throw some stuff away. Memory full, it says. And you know, if you have a computer, you can upgrade your hard drive, that's great. If you have the kind I have, you can. I'm not gonna say what it is, <coughs> Apple. But um, <laughs> okay, so there it is, memory full, no room. Wouldn't it be great if the devil came with all of his impure thoughts, all of his wicked thoughts, and he came knocking on our door and all of a sudden a little sign pops up, memory full, no room for you filled with the Word of God, filled with the Scripture, filled with the promises of God, memory full, put on the helmet and protect your mind. As we sing, Jesus is coming soon. So wake up, sober up, suit up. Be ready. Here's what we're told over in Romans 11, 13 from a uh, paraphrase translation, the Phillips translation. Listen to this, I love this. Why all this stress on behavior? Because they think you've realized the present time is of the highest importance. It's time to wake up to reality. Every day brings God's salvation earlier. The night is nearly over. The day is almost on. Let us therefore fling away the things that men do in the dark. Let us arm ourselves to the fight of the day. Let us live cleanly as in the daylight, not in getting drunk or playing with sex, not in quarreling or jealousies. Let us be Christ's men from head to foot and give no chance for the flesh to have its fling. Man, that is an amazing translation. Especially that final part. Let us be Christ's men and Christ's women from head to foot and give no chances for the flesh to have its fling. Let me close by asking you, are you Christ's man or woman? Are you ready for his return? As I've shared these things with you today, do you think, you know, I'm not actually really positive. I'm ready to meet the Lord. Maybe you're doing something you should not be doing. Maybe you're playing with sex, as the Bible says you should not be. Maybe you're intoxicated all the time, and, or you're partying, or whatever it is you're doing. These things are keeping you from God. It's time to let go of those things and to wake up and to sober up because Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? He could come today. He could come tonight. I want to give you an opportunity to get ready. As you listen to this message right now, if you are not absolutely convinced that you're ready to meet the Lord, if you're not totally sure, and if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. Respond to this invitation I'm going to give now as we close in prayer. Your eternity hangs in the balance of what you do next. Let's pray. Father, we've heard your word. Now I pray for those who do not yet know you. We pray that your Holy Spirit will convict and convince them of their sin and that you would bring them to yourself now. Now when our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying. How many of you would say, Greg, I'm not sure if I'm ready for Jesus' return. I need him in my life. I need his forgiveness. Pray for me. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. If you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die, wherever you are, I want you to raise your hand up and I'll pray for you. Raise your hand up high where I can see it. God bless you. God bless you. Hands are going up. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up. You want Christ in your life. You want your sin forgiven. God bless all of you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up now. God bless you. You're not sure that you'll go to heaven when you die, but you want Christ in your life. Raise your hand up. Let me pray for you. God bless each one of you. Anybody else? God bless. While our heads are still bowed, maybe some of you would say, you know, 
I'm not right with God. I'm doing stuff I know I shouldn't be doing as a Christian. I've been doing some of the things you were talking about. And I need to stop doing them. I need to repent. I'm ready to recommit my life to Jesus right now because I want to be ready for his return. Pray for me. If that's you, raise your hand up. If you need to come back to the Lord, raise your hand up. Even if I can't see you, raise your hand up. You're watching a screen. You're wherever you are. Just take that little step. God bless each one of you. Now I'm going to ask every one of you that has raised your hand, if you would, please, I want you to stand up wherever you are. Stand up. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Stand to your feet. Stand up. That's right. Others are standing. Do you need to be one of them? Stand up. God bless. Wherever you are, stand up. If you're watching this screen, stand up. This is not between you and Greg. Doesn't matter if I can see you. This is between you and God. Stand up. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And God will hear this prayer wherever you are. Because it's a prayer to him. Anybody else? You need to get right with God. You want Christ in your life. You need to come back to the Lord. Stand to your feet right now. Let me lead you in this prayer. One final moment. Anybody else? Stand now. God bless all of you standing. Now I want all of you standing to pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me. Pray this now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising again from the dead. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this moment forward. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless every one of you that prayed that prayer. God bless you guys, amen.